Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the last panel in our conference this week. Thank you so much for being here. Um, please feel free if you want to join the conversation to use the Q&A function and to use the chat function to ask questions of our panelists. Um, my name is Michaela Gill. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am co-founder and vice president of Fulbright Prism. I am tuning in from the ancestral lands of the Wabanaki people. And for those of you who can hear me but can't see me for whatever reason, I have long brown hair. I'm a white woman and I have a white wall behind me. So um, if the panelists wouldn't mind doing a short introduction of yourselves, and then I'll talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about Prism, and then we'll get into the questions. So uh, Dr. Bedell, do you want to start? Yes, yes, thanks so much. And uh, Michaela, thanks so much for organizing this and putting this together and, and for starting PRISM. I was really, really excited to see um, this organization um, start up. And I know when I did my Fulbright in 2014 and 15, it just felt like there wasn't really any kind of coordinated effort um, for queer people. So um, I'm, I'm just really, really excited about what you all are doing. And um, and really excited to participate. Um, I'm Dr. Marcus Bedell, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, I teach at Hunter College, and I also teach at the Graduate Center um, in New York City. Um, I'm originally from the West Coast in New Mexico. Um, it's the current and ancestral lands of the Sandia and Zuni tribe. Um, else can I tell you about myself? I did a Fulbright in 2014, 2015. Um, I'm an applied psychologist. So I have a degree in clinical counseling and school psychology from University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, I've been training mental health providers for probably about 25 years. Um, and uh, when I got my Fulbright, I uh, was in the UK and also did a lot of work um, in the uh, European Union. And I, I was basically looking at how providers work competently or, or not with LGBTQI plus uh, patients, uh, both in mental health and uh, medical facilities. And uh, through my work with the Fulbright, I developed a new scale. It's the LGBT development of clinical skill scale. And it was just really exciting that I was able to create an instrument that bridge not just the US, but but also had a really large sample of, of UK participants, um, which is one of my concerns that so much of our scholarship is, is pretty myopic and, you know, so US centric and the Fulbright really offers amazing opportunities for us to, you know, branch out and, and grow as, as scholars, um, but then also create research um, that's that's not this myopic um, myopic U.S. focus. So I'm just really glad to be here and uh, look forward to participating. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Um, my name is Sharon Horn, and uh, I uh, use she and they pronouns, and I um, reside on the unceded land of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts First Nations. And I really am so excited about Fulbright Prism. I really want to thank you, Michaela, and I think Tim and Laura, um, for for your founding of this um, this great. Um, I mean, it's just exciting to see this pulled together for LGBTQ um, concerns with within Fulbright, and so it's just incredible the work that you're doing. And I'm just thrilled to be invited and be a part of it today. So. I want to thank you for that. And I, uh, I have white skin and a uh, blue shirt on with polka dots and uh, uh, shoulder length hair and glasses. And I have a white screen behind me that's, that's hiding a, a very large mess that um, you can't see, hopefully. And um, I, um, I uh, um, have been doing LGBTQ related research for many years, like 25 years. And um, 
one of the main um, areas of my work is, is the intersection of policies and like legal um, anti-LGBTQ legislation and its impact on mental health for people. The Fulbright that I was uh, had the opportunity to do was um, it, I was a global scholar, which is a new a newer mechanism in Fulbright um, that allows shorter term um, um, visits and collaborations. So um, it was to, supposed to be 2018 to 2020, and I was um, work I was working in Colombia and South Africa and the Philippines. This the third part. Um, the third segment with, with my colleagues in the Philippines has been postponed due to COVID, but I'm hopeful that I might still get to have that opportunity next year. We're waiting to see. And the other um, aspect of my work is um, a lot of advocacy. I, I'm one of the representatives for the American Psychological Association for the International Psychology Psychological Network of LGBT Issues. And that is a, that is a, um, a community of uh, LGBTQ identified scholars um, and allies who um, are working on organizational psychological um, concerns related to LGBT. And um, as a group, we had created a statement on behalf of psychological concerns. And I'll just probably talk more about that. Um, so I'm just thrilled to be here and I, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Because you both uh, mentioned how exciting PRISM is, I am going to brag for a little bit and give everyone some background. So we were founded in 2018 by myself, Tim Sentenegg, and Laura Steinecke. We met in Germany as English teaching assistants, and we were inspired by Fulbright Noir on Instagram. So if you don't follow them, please do. Um, their Instagram is for Black Fulbrighters. And we decided that LGBTQ Fulbrighters should have a similar platform to share achievements, stories, experiences with one another and the broader Fulbright community. In March 2019, we were recognized as a United States 501c3, and we remain focused on highlighting stories of queer Fulbrighters, pulling um, queer-friendly resources for people living abroad, and then networking and hosting events like these for community building. So if you wanna learn more about us and our team and what we're doing, you can follow us on Instagram at Fulbright Prism, or you can check out our website at fulbrightprism.com. I'll put some links in the chat also so you can follow up. So this leads nicely into my very first question for the panelists here. We founded Fulbright Prism because we saw a community need, something that was missing that Fulbright wasn't meeting. And each of you has played a really integral part in creating a tool to measure and improve mental health care for LGBTQIA people. Can you give us some context about how and why you and your peers were driven to create the IPSINET statement and SOX? I don't know who wants to start. Maybe we can start with Dr. Horn this time. Sure. Um... Well, the statement, um, and I can put the link, I'll put the link in um, where you can find it. Um, it, it it's, uh, we started meeting um, in 2002, there was a conference that APA um, and the European Association of Psychologists at the time um, said we should, we should be talking about international concerns and global concerns within LGBTQ um, issues and um, communities. And so out of that meeting, um, I sign up was born and it's, um, it's basically a, a countries, different psychological organizations send representatives and we meet quarterly and we work on projects together. And sometimes it's, um, it's anywhere from um, reports of like initiatives that different psychological organizations have taken on to other um, events happening in, in the country. So like, for example, right now, Hong Kong is working very hard on marriage um, equality concerns, and they talk about that. Um, others, are, you know, representatives from Eastern Europe are talking about all the, the very strong anti-LGBTQ 
movements occurring there. So uh, we have a lot of different initiatives, but one of them was to create a statement um, that would be, um, you know, important for mental health. I mean, we have a lot of rights statements and really good, you know, the yoga car to principles that come from the legal field. We have we have a lot of United Nations um, documents, but we felt it was important from counseling and from psychology to make a statement about our commitment and the role basically that mental health had played in so much of the pathologization and marginalization of LGBTQ people and communities. So, so um, as a group, we came together, multiple countries. Um, I chaired that effort and we came, you know, we, we made a strong statement around, you know, access to, um, to care um, that was inclusive of, of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex concerns, and um, about inclusive treatment, service, access, um, was anti-conversion therapy and rep reparation, you know, all of the bad therapy that's out there. Um, and then we had to get, we were, got it signed by different psychological organizations, and I can tell you, you know, it took a long time to get through APA because um, there's, you know, lots of bureaucracy. But um, we were able to have that um, a statement that we all could support, um, and then it was it was signed in um, in Montreal at the International Congress of Psychology and endorsed by 17 initial organizations. But it's now um, 43 psychological organizations and two regional organizations have endorsed it and it's now translated into 13, it's now in 13 languages. And it's being used in different ways. Um, for example, the Polish psychological um, organizations are facing tremendous, um, they, they have the anti-LGBT zones that were passed by different municipalities um, in Poland. And so they're like using the statement to try to make a case for for these being um, removed along with many other you know, supports and documents. But it's something we were excited to, um, to, to be able to, to work together on. And um, so I'll, I can provide the link. And you know, we've just had new members join from um, the Bangladesh Psychological Organization. We have um, from Lebanon and from, you know, from every area of the world now is um, those organizations have come out in support of it. So we're pretty excited about what it can, the potential for it to, to help within mental health fields and psychology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. It's, it's really incredible. Dr. Bedell, do you want to kind of talk about your work in this similar vein? Yeah, I, you know, I just want to thank Sharon um, for her work and her leadership. Uh, what you've done is really uh, probably, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that it was miraculous. <laughs> and um, getting this through all of these organizations. Um, and, and like Sharon, I'm really interested in how when we change policy, you know, when we, you know, when the American Psychiatric Association depathologized homosexuality, how that, you know, there was pushback, but, but there also was no longer um, the sort of mechanism for a lot of other institutions to, you know, kind of say, see, there's a medical organization that pathologizes queer people. Um, so, so these types of um, structural changes are incredibly profound. So I just want to thank you, Sharon. I'm, I'm really in awe of, of the work that you've done. And um, I, I just think it's so incredibly important. Um, and you know, I'll take a, maybe a bit of a different uh, stance that my work actually started in my doc program uh, back in the 90s. And I went to UC Santa Barbara. And um, I don't know if we have any students. Um, I'm on the Fulbright Student Review Board, so I, I'm I just love reviewing, um, you know, graduate students and undergraduate applicants, um, primarily to the UK program. But um, I hope we, I think, probably have some students attending. Um, but you know, I was a doc student, um, and, and I was uh, kind of a late arrival to college. 
um, just through my own uh, trajectory. I was a carpenter um, before, so you can imagine for me to get into to doc school, it, it took a long time. Um, so my very first course, um, my first year in my doc program was with a professor. I had been warned by two other uh, queer students that he was quote unquote homophobic. And um, so, you know, I started the class and um, everything was seemed to be going fine. <laughs> um, and we had to write, it was a career theory course. So we had to write a paper on our um, theory. And, you know, I talked about being, being gay and, you know, getting kicked out of my house and not graduating from high school and um, just a lot of the, the sort of trauma, right? The minority stress that I had experienced. And then in particular, the AIDS epidemic um, and how that, you know, I, uh, I was a carpenter and I started volunteering at AIDS organizations. And that's what really led me into psychology. Um, so, you know, I submitted my paper. It was very personal, uh, very heartfelt. And the next week, um, the professor asked me to meet him after class um, outside in the breezeway. And we stood out there and he said, you know, it's obvious from your paper that, that you're homosexual. Um, and he said, you know, do you know about me? And I, he was African-American, which, you know, added a, a, another layer of complexity uh, just because of the lack of diversity and people of color in psychology. And I said, you know, I do, you know, doctor, I mean, uh, you know, if there was a racist professor, you could imagine that, you know, the African-American students would, you know, <laughs> clue you in. So I said, I, I know that you're homophobic. Um, and so he corrected me and said, well, I'm actually not homophobic. I'm not afraid of you. I'm anti-homosexual. And then spent about the next hour outlining his positions. Um, so, you know, this is my first class. I'm just starting off at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and, and, you know, like literally my mouth is on the ground. I'm like, I cannot believe this is happening. Um, and of course, this is really before, like, and why I, I tip my hat to Sharon, you know, the APA policies, you know, nothing existed. There was really nothing for me to kind of hold on to, um, you know, so our position statements on uh, reparative therapy had not been uh, articulated yet. People were working on them, but they had not come to fruition. Um, and he was very pro reparative therapy, had, tr had been trying to offer it in our in our clinic. So, you know, it was just, I just got myself into a quite a mess, my first, very first class. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, the final paper was a research paper on career issues. And I wanted to research LGBTQI plus individuals. And he forbid me to do it. Um, so, uh, you know, it went to the faculty, it went to deans, I, who knows where it went to. Um, ultimately, I had to disenroll from the course in order to write the paper. So, you know, this created just a lot. I mean, there were student meetings and all kinds of things that were happening. Um, I, I'm pretty introverted. So for me, it was kind of a horror to start the program and I was, you know, outed in a nanosecond and um, it, it was tough. But what really bothered me um, out of everything that, that came of that, but what bothered me the most is that I felt that I saw fellow students who, who with the right, who were definitely not competent, who probably grew up, you know, I grew up Catholic. They grew up in traditional religious families, had lots of stereotypes about queer people. And, um, but I felt with the right training, they could have really um, addressed the needs of LGBTQI plus patients. But I felt with this particular professor, they were sliding backwards. Like he was such a strong advocate sort of for their beliefs. Um, and so I actually saw them, you know, kind of uh, sliding back and, and, and getting more rigid. Um, so I, you know, I thought, well, maybe I should create a training program or, you know, again, none of this existed at this time in, you know, 1999, 1998, 1997, um, 1996 is when I started. <laughs> uh, so I thought, okay, I'll create a training program. And, and then, um, my committee came back and said, well, you don't even have an assessment. There's not even a tool to measure. There's been nothing created uh, psychometrically. 
So that's what led to the development of the Sexual Orientation Counselor Competency Scale, the SOX. Um, so that was my dissertation. Um, and then of course, you live with that for a while and I realized how limiting it was um, and that there were lots of things about the scale that um, I felt that it really missed. So my Fulbright was um, kind of my work to expand it and create a broader scale. Um, and, and that's the uh, LGBT development of clinical skills scale. So, you know, it came, it, all of this work came from a really difficult and uh, painful experience in my very first um, doctoral class um, with this uh, professor. And I, you know, it was great when I got my Fulbright because UC Santa Barbara asked me to write a, uh, a piece about getting the Regents Fulbright. And I, I was so proud to be able to write within this piece about, I didn't name him, but I did discuss this experience that happened at UC Santa Barbara and said, you know, that there is that old adage of making lemonade out of lemons. And, you know, this was a very difficult and painful experience, but it really put me on a, on a trajectory. And, and I was proud that, that, you know, UC Santa Barbara published it um, and that they, they didn't, you know, ask me to remove any of this. And, and of course, as all, uh, frustrating professors and, uh, you know, he's become a dean, which is really um, frustrating for me. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's really how my, my process went. Wow, I'm, I'm blown away by how much has changed in so little time. Uh, it seems like over the course of your careers, in large part, thanks to the two of you. So thank you again. Um, I, I'm going to jump to a question for you, Dr. Horn, but I'm happy to hear both of your opinions on this. I know that you've studied and spent time in countries in which it's still really dangerous or illegal to be out as LGBTQ. Do you have any sort of advice or, or even just general information for potentially a new Fulbrighter entering and working in an unsafe or difficult environment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I have worked in many places where it's, um, it's illegal or it's um, punishable, criminalized. Um, most, uh, the majority of my work has been in post-communist countries, in particular Russia um, and Central Asia. And, um, and, I, and I, I mean, a lot of my research has actually been watching what's happened over time. Um, when, uh, for example, for Russia, it didn't have to go that way. Um, in the, in the um, 1990s, when it uh, train, changed over, it was actually moving in, a, in a quite a similar direction to a lot of Western Europe, but with the, uh, the rise of authoritarianism and with Putin coming in, it's gone completely you know, in a different direction and it's very dangerous. And I was, um, I helped with the LGBT programming for the European Congress in 2019. Um, I, I basically was the, the chair of that section to try to get as much LGBT programming on. Um, and so in our conference, even we had people turning over our flag outside of our meetings and um, it was quite, um, and this was a place I, I lived in the nineties and uh, was part of, you know, the, the, a different time. So to have it be so um, constricted and so um, unsafe, I, I guess, um, and wondering, you know, uh, I mean, there was actually even a, a gay slur um, outside of one of our meetings when we were meeting in a Congress, in a, in a conference, um, because they knew it was an LGBT group. So it was, um, 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 it's, it's, it's hard. I also feel that I, I, I remember, I try to remind myself of the privilege that I have, um, as a white U S person, um, coming into different spaces and that often what I can do and say is very different than what people living in those contexts can, uh, how they can live as LGBT. So, um, 
so I try to like, um, I try to be safe and think about like, you know, there are places where I think there could be things that I say or do that could get me into big trouble. Um, in that case, my best, one of my best friends said, I'm coming with you. <laughs> and uh, so, but it, it went well and we were able to um, provide a space for all these LGBT activists who are just doing Russian activists, just doing the work day to day, every day fighting it. So, um, you know, there, um, there are many places I've been where it's not safe, um, but I also, I also, I try to remember that I have, um, there's like in Colombia where um, there, there are significant rights. I mean, they have rights to marriage, there's rights to parenting, all of those, the equality is there, but it's not necessarily realized on the, um, you know, it's politically very clear that, but not necessarily safe for everybody. So I did like 18 workshops in six weeks while I was there because with my colleagues, you know, and, you know, one of them said to me, he said, you know, you, there are things that you can say that we can't say, but we need you to say. And, and then it highlights what we're doing and it gives us credibility. So I tried to figure out what is, what, what is my role um, to support, what, how can I support what they are trying to achieve, you know, in terms of LGBT supports and, and um, community there. So um, I always say, you know, it's just, uh, we, we lose people all the time, you know, um, who are our, our activists and advocates all over the world who are LGBT. And that's one of my areas of research. I've been interviewing LGBT activists around the world. Um, and so we are quite protected in many ways. Um, and I think that's, um, it's, it's important balance to remember to be safe and to think about what you can do, but to, but to push it. You know, like this is this is the this is the power that we can contribute to um, advocating and supporting um, LGBT people all over. Thank you. I love the way that you frame that. That's that's fantastic. I don't know, Dr. Goodell, if you have anything to add or anything um, from your perspective, if somebody is looking for a practitioner or if somebody is practicing in potentially an unsafe environment, um, do you have any thoughts on a situation like that? You know, I think, um, Sharon, you've worked a lot more in countries um, that um, have had uh, direct policies um, around LGBTQI folks. Um, you know, as you were sharing, I was just thinking in my international work, um, how many times like I've been at conferences where I've, I've listened to colleagues um, from, um, you know, African countries, uh, certainly Russia, um, that really resonated with me. Um, I remember listening to a panel talk about um, attending uh, an LGBTQ uh, I plus pride um, uh, parade where uh, the police were holding back um, rioters that uh, had weapons and, and um, eventually the police line broke and the, the queer activists had to get onto a bus um, and they showed film footage of the windows being broken and um, the level of violence was um, uh, incredibly humbling and really disturbing and I you know I think you know, what you were saying about, you know, our privilege, certainly being a white man and, and the, the privileges that we share um, here in the U.S., um, you know, whenever I, I, I hear those colleagues' stories, it, it really speaks to me. Um, you know, I guess I perhaps, uh, I'm not sure what I learned in Boy Scouts, but perhaps safety first is something that really comes to mind, um, you know, as a Fulbrighter. So, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about doing another Fulbright um, scholarship application. And I've been looking at, you know, potentially going to Africa. Um, my husband's also from Barbados. So I'm really interested in the Caribbean 
Um, and, and Barbados is, is, I think, really kind of a shining example of where it's not legal. They don't have legal rights for LGBTQ folks, but there's a lot of acceptance. Um, and I, I guess I just want to do a throw out for Mia Motley, who's the prime minister of, of Barbados. And um, she is out in, in, I think, a Caribbean way um, as a lesbian. Um, and she's the first lesbian Caribbean uh, leader. Um, I, anytime you can get a chance to Google her, if you just Google the talk that she made at the UN just a, a couple of days ago, it was incredibly powerful. Um, she really speaks truth to power. Um, I'm, I'm off on my tangent of just uh, my absolute um, adoration for Mia Motley. So I think Barbados is a, is, um, a bit of an outlier. Um, for a lot of the Caribbean countries. But, you know, for instance, I'm interested in, you know, doing some work in uh, Jamaica, um, where there's incredible um, dangers for LGBTQI plus folks. Um, but I think always, you know, you know, we have to stay safe, we have to, you know, think about our own safety. But then, you know, as Sharon said, I think it's a really good point. How can we use our privilege to, um, you know, and again, I would say bring in some of these um, structural policies um, that, that have happened, you know, things that the APA has put out, um, that the international organizations have put out, and use that to help different countries kind of start um, their process and, and help them move forward. Thank you. And thank you for the plug. We always support plugging <laughs> important and inspiring people. Um, we do have, I have a couple questions to kind of build off of each other, but we're going to start with this one um, from Miley. Thank you for this question. I think that LGBT plus activism is necessary, but difficult work. How do you stay grounded in your activism and communities and how do you avoid burnout? Whoever wants to start, just go for it. You want to go, Marcus? Or I, I don't know, Dr. Horn. Do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I've been feeling fairly burned out lately. So <laughs> I think it's hard to to have that expectation. I think you know. I think we have to. You know, I think we have to figure out what is. Um, we have to constantly be assessing. Are 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 we being effective, and how much are we doing? And is it do you know? There's always a balance that has to be kept, and um, it's hard. And and I also think you know, again, I go back to like being in, there. There's a lot of privilege for the kind of activism that I'm mostly in, in that's engaged in is mostly through research, and then trying to get that um, translate that these findings to be um, accessible and helpful and at and play a role. You know, I mean. There's certainly, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to do activism that are uh, are needed, and so um, so that's my main way of of engaging. But I have done lots of community work for many years. That there were times that, you know, um, it, it, you know, you have to figure out: can, is this really um, um, something I can do right now? Because it's, you know, sometimes that you're you're you turn into um reaction just like we just gotta respond and react and um and a lot of activism is um you know the, the, we have to we have to be planful we have to think about it um how we're going about doing the work and so um so i try to figure out what i just try to always figure out what is my best what is my my, my contribution you know how can i use my outsider status to be um to be helpful um and i'm thinking about like colombia and, and south africa where my fulbrights were um uh, what i did in my work was i was interviewing lgbt client people who had been to therapy and counseling about their experience um and in thinking about like how do we communicate that back because my colleagues in these countries are saying we need spaces that are supportive and that LGBT people can freely go and know that they're going to get um, mental health care and support 
that's that's not going to harm them. And um, so that's it's a, that's some of the work that I was doing. And I also now I want to extend my gratitude to um, Dr. Bedell too, because um, we're we're doing a research using the LGBT clinical scales. So because you did all that work for so long, it allows me to like have an easier job of like uh, assessing mental health professionals in these um, countries and and it more rapidly to see where are the gaps, where are the, where are the assumptions that they're you know they're saying that they they need more training or they want to understand better how to serve um, their LGBT clients. So. Um, but you know, I, back to the original question, um, I am no um, stranger to burnout, and you know that, that I also have to say sometimes this is too much, and um, it, it, once my effectiveness is kind of waning, then it's time to to reassess the methods and the strategies and the, the engagements. Yeah, I guess you want me to go next. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just state the question again so I can um, try to stay yeah. focused. It's kind of a, a two-parter. How do you stay grounded in your community and your activism? And how do you avoid burnout? Okay. Um, uh, you know, I have a really, um, I have a good home life. And I've, I've worked really hard on it. And, and that's ultimately like I, my co-pilot, I'll, I'll show you here. This is, um, this is Zia. And uh, she, <laughs> she is a, you know, a huge part of uh, staying grounded. And, uh, you know, my, my husband and my friends and family. Um, so for me, that's, that's been really crucial. Um, I think also, you know, my own therapy. Um, I, when I think about, you know, what's probably caused more of my burnout, it's been my clinical work more so than my research work. I find that with my research work, there's a, um, a real sort of sense of separation um, and I can pick it up and put it down. Um, but I, I have definitely um, been far more impacted from a burnout perspective doing clinical work. Um, I was sharing just at, at the start of this, um, you know, COVID in particular was, um, I had stopped doing clinical work for a while because I was burnt out. And when COVID hit, um, I reactivated my license and um, started doing um, some really, really, some of the most intense work I've ever done. And, and as I said, I started my career in HIV AIDS. Um, and I felt like it was more intense than, than that particular uh, time period. Um, so I feel like that's where I need to be, you know, as a psychologist, I need to be especially mindful um, kind of how I deal with my clinical work, um, what kind of patients I'm working with, what kind of issues um, that, that they're bringing. Um, and, and certainly, you know, what, what happened just with the Trump administration, uh, the amount of trauma that that, that instilled in, in folks that I was working with, um, and then of course the epidemic. Um, but I, I feel like that's an area that I, you know, I have a supervision group. Um, I, I try to get a lot of support. Um, I, I even reach sometimes for external consultation. Um, and, and I am not afraid to put myself into therapy if I feel like, you know, and I, I have certain sort of benchmarks that I know when I'm coming a bit unraveled. Um, I'm old enough now that it's like, oh, okay, you know, I'm, I'm waking up at four in the morning for the last, you know, two weeks. I need to, I need to get some support. I need to get some help. Um, uh, but definitely, you know, it's funny, like, I think my research work on many levels is a comfort to me. Um, and I do more quantitative research than I do qualitative. So, you know, I can kind of get lost in statistics. I, I do most of my own stats. I'm a bit of a stats nerd. And um, 
So, you know, and I also, I supervise a lot of students because I teach in a clinical neuropsych program at uh, the graduate center, and then I teach master's students. So I'm supervising. So between like my own practice and then all of the, the clients that I um, am supervising, I, I feel like I take in a lot of um, sort of the zeitgeist of, of what's happening in the world. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, I do yoga, I ride my bike, I play with my dog, I, I really try to do very, very simple things um, to keep myself grounded. Um, and I still do carpentry and woodwork. Um, and as I, as I say, I, when I feel a bit frayed, I, I really try to reach out and, and add in extra support when I need it, because this work is tough. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, I've been consulting with my niece a lot, who's been working with Planned Parenthood in Tennessee, and she just graduated with an MSW. And um, you can imagine with what's going on, the kind of burnout that she's been feeling. Um, so we've just been talking a lot about, you know, how do you, how do you deal with this? Um, uh, I guess the last piece, you know, I'm thinking a bit because she's asked me a lot about the AIDS, and I was an ACT UP. And I did a lot of protesting. I did needle exchange. I was arrested. And um, I, I also found that incredibly cathartic. So I, you know, I think plugging into communities, having, you know, really um, community uh, opportunities to sort of express anger and outrage and, and agitate um, for change can also be um, incredibly healing um, and connecting. So, um, you know, that's certainly something else that, uh, that uh, it, it's different now because of social media. And in some ways, there's more opportunities to do that. And in some ways, I'm a bit old fashioned. I miss, you know, some of the more organic coalescing things that we used to do. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities uh, for us to do that. I just wanted to add too that I appreciate all that you're saying, um, Marcus, around your thought, it, like what you do, and um, and I share that. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking about because I I was thinking about also ways to give different. That's not um, necessarily just LGBT. Like I work at the food bank here, and you know, being parts of communities that give you a little bit of a break from. The intense um, focus on on LGBTQ concerns that's always there, um, but you know, surrounding myself with other um, other uh, uh, literature group I work with and um, and my family too. So I have kids that keep me like I'm on the soccer field or the baseball field, you know, most weekends, uh, and that's like incredibly. Um, helpful to just enforce this kind of break that um, it can't all, you know, you can't, you're not going to be able to solve everything. You're not going to be able to like address um, even, even the tiniest, you know, even just a little bit, but you can do what you can and, and then you have to take care of yourself and your family and, and your mental health. And I totally agree that there are times therapy needs to be you know, very, very much, very present. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you both. Um, this isn't as fully formed a question, but it's been coming up since we did introductions, honestly. Um, this is a question for me personally. <laughs> How do the two of you, or maybe, maybe you have advice or tips on navigating the bureaucracy of change. Um, both of you have done this. You both mentioned it answering the very first question that I posed in your introductions. Um, you've had to challenge some people with more power than you. You've had to navigate a lot of paperwork um, to try to do some good in the, word, in the world. I don't really even have a question, but that's what we're trying to do here with Fulbright Prism. So if you have any tips or bits of advice, I'd love to hear it. I would just say always keeping keeping in mind the the 
the values that uh, are informing, you know, the, the aims that you're going for and the goals that you're going for and having that kind of um, in mind that you're, that you're trying to get to. Um, because there are, I love what you just said, the bureaucracy of change, because there is so much bureaucracy to achieve like significant um, policy changes, significant, you know, um, everything, I, you know, anything that's in a, a large system. So I think it's trying to remember like, what are the, what are the driving, um, community ideas, values that are saying, this is important and we, we need to do this. And we may not get it done this time. And it may look different than what we were hoping for, but it may get us closer and that there, there will be setbacks and there will be times that we're just um, treading water. We're not gonna get anywhere for a while, or maybe we don't have the right people, or maybe we need to think about a different strategy, but to keep in mind that the the goals and usually within lgbt it's it's goals of of being you know being seen being visible being treated um having equality um having you know respectful and um fair treatment in terms of the kind of work we do in counseling and psychology um so having those that those um, drive our day-to-day -day attempts to to do that, and 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 they're and having the support, having the support along the way, like that you're not the only one saying this is important, is 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 key. You know, it's so important to me <laughs> to to have a group that's going for that, and you know, like what Marcus was talking about with the HIV um, epidemic and pandemic um, and some of the the work that we were doing about anti um, the marriage amendments in the 2000s was such rewarding work because we were working together and the whole community is trying to fight these state bills and and, and finding and when you find those those people that share that vision who want to be in it with you want to be in the battle want to be in it um, there's nothing like it. And, and, and there's so much that can be achieved through that. And so we're, we have different mechanisms these days with social media. And we're trying to figure all this out, I think. But um, yeah, those are just keeping, the, keeping it in mind where you're trying to get to and doing it together with others is so important to, to the work that I've been doing. That's a really great point. And I, I am going to ask you the same question, Dr. Bedell, but I do want to plug, we have um, Fulbright Prism is one of a few different identity groups that have sprung up over the last few years. Uh, they're all linked on our website, but we have, uh, all of us have created what we call the Fulbright Diversity Collective. There's Fulbright Noir, who was the first of us, and then us. There's Fulbright Lotus, Fulbright Salam, Fulbright Latinx. I hope all of you, if you're interested, will check them out. All of them have Instagram accounts at the least, and they're all linked to our website. And I have loved working with them. It's been, it really has helped that it's not just, you know, three of us, our Fulbright Prism team has expanded as has our, uh, as has our other diversity collective peers. So thank you for that. <laughs> Dr. Bedell, do you have any thoughts on the, the bureaucracy of change? Oh, I want I want to say something directly to what Sharon said, but Michaela, you you reminded me something that I really wanted to bring up, and that's um, and, and again, I'm just giving a plug for Fulbright Prism and the Fulbright program that's allowing these sort of um, you know specialty organizations to spring up. Because when I had my Fulbright, this didn't exist, um, and when I went to the UK, I remember um, you know our induction, and there were all the students and all the scholars. And I was the only uh, queer person there. And it did feel lonely. Um, and, uh, you know, I was in a country that was obviously, you know, even ahead of the US around um, its sort of policies and laws. Um, and I was invited a couple of years ago to give the Eccles lecture, which is a Fulbright lecture um, 
uh, in the UK. Um, so I went back and was really honored to give the, it was um, uh, Stonewall 25 and they were kind of celebrating it in the UK. And so I came back and, um, and I, I wasn't trying to shame the UK Fulbright organization or the US, but I was basically saying, you know, I was really the first sort of open person doing LGBTQ research. Um, and I asked the, the UK Fulbright Association to see if there was anybody else prior to me and they couldn't, they couldn't come up with anybody. And they said, you know, we've had a lot of LGBTQI plus people, like we're really, we're really supportive, but somehow it just, you know, like things haven't really kind of gelled. So I, you know, my hope is that with PRISM, like if I had known PRISM had existed, I would have plugged in immediately um, to try to get some more support. Um, and, and I've even like applied for grants in the US Department of Education and realized that this is probably, you know, like nobody has ever gotten a grant looking at LGBTQ homeless people from the Department of Ed, right? Like, so, I, you know, I, I think, uh, Maybe this is kind of getting to what you're saying, you know, trying to develop communities, get support, um, trying to build uh, coalitions and alliances is really, really important. Um, and Sharon, you said something that really, really stuck with me. And it reminded me back of that first experience with my professor. Um, and I guess I learned this lesson early in my career where as things were escalating, like where you could imagine, like there were student meetings and faculty meetings and deans getting involved. And um, at one point it became really clear to me that the professor wanted me to escalate this and, and file formal complaints. Um, and if I, if I were like to go back through his emails, it, it was just a bit creepy. Like he was like, you know, I don't fear the Supreme Court or I don't fear, you know, it was really like obvious to me, like he wanted me to really take this on um, and really kind of go, go at this. And then there would be, you know, uh, education, you know, um, academic freedom and freedom of speech, like all these really complicated issues. Um, and I, I remember I had to make a decision. I thought, you know, that's not why, I, why I'm in graduate school. You know, I'm here to get a degree and I'm here to do queer research. And I have to stay focused on that. Um, and kind of what you said, Sharon, like that was a battle that was just absolutely above and beyond. Like it, maybe I could have gone there, who knows what would have happened, but it would have been such a distraction um, for kind of the you know my work and my purpose so i really had to that that, that sense of sort of staying focused and say, staying true and i always had to remind myself i'm here to get a degree you know i'm not here to fight this big huge battle on academic freedom and freedom of speech um and I, you know i i made a compromise i you know i i did have to disenroll from the class i had to take an independent study i you know the, but but I felt like that was staying much truer to me and what my goal was um, than to, you know, hire a lawyer, <laughs> get, you know, so like with these kinds of, you know, when you do this kind of work, it can really kind of mushroom um, and it all kinds of other issues can, can come up. Um, I guess one other thing that I really want to, because, you know, the three of us are uh, self-identified as white people and, um, I, I also really think that we need to do a lot more work um, in, in psychology in particular to really engage um, other communities and to, to really um, open up psychology to students of color and students with different backgrounds. And I think we have such a long way to go um, in, in doing that. So, you know, that's always, you know, uh, when we're kind of talking about priorities and goals, that's one of the things that I'm really focused on now. Um, and, you know, if I want to collaborate with a person of color, it, it sometimes it's very difficult because there's, there's just such few um, folks out there. And I, and I think psychology, um, we, we just need to do a much better job uh, in this arena. Completely agree. Thank you for bringing up that point, Marcus. Yes, thank you. 
Um, I'm going to ask maybe two more questions if you two have time. I don't want to go over and take up too much of your time. Is that all right with both of you? All right. I'm going to ask a, a kind of a more general question about your Fulbright experience, since that is kind of why we're here. Um, what was maybe a highlight and low light of your Fulbright experience? I know Dr. Horniers is still ongoing or maybe on pause, but anything you'd like to share, um, I'd love to hear it. Uh, wow, I had so many highlights um, with um, both my work in Colombia and in South Africa, but I um, remember I had such a great experience uh, going with one of my colleagues from the, um, the, the Colombian Psych Association. We went to Ibagué, which is um, outside of um, Bogota, another um, town. And there, the um, and met with a lot of the NGOs that were doing LGBT work, and some, and did, we did a workshop. But um, the most fabulous part of it was um, um, the town, the I guess I forget, it was the governor, or the mayor, or the person who was in charge of that area, um, basically opened up the governor's. It's probably the mayoral hall to these organizations to come to this training, and so all these people came into into the building, and um, and I I did you know a short talk about what therapy and counseling looks like when you know it's really LGBT um, um, inclusive affirming whatever language you want to use in terms of respecting LGBT complete, um, individuals. And, and um, at the end, they were, all, they were all excited about what, what we were talking about. But what was really fabulous was they all started turning to each other and saying, we have this event going on. Will you come? Nobody comes to our film festival that we're doing. And all these groups started like saying, oh, we'll be there. And then other was, was saying, oh, we've had this problem. We can't get an answer from so-and-so on this issue. And three or four people popped up and a lot of, you know, this was all in Spanish, which is my Spanish is very limited, but um, interpreter was saying, well, they're, they're like organizing this and they're organizing this. And it was just, um, it was so fabulous to, to watch LGBT uh, organizational life um, just, just, taking taking it on and, and having it be respected that they were invited into the government space. And that was really so, so fun to, to see and be a part of. And, um, and I had some similar experiences like that in South Africa too, with different um, workshops and groups that were like, I'm so glad we had this time with the space to talk about this. So, so I think it was such a gift to me to have that time and be um, welcomed into these communities that were doing the real, the real work. So, and hard part, um, my hardest part was my my partner, my partner, and my kids came and um, <laughs> and I organized this trip around Colombia and I did, or my Spanish is so limited and I got tickets for us to try to get from one city to another on Christmas day. And they said, oh, we don't have a bus, it's not going. So my family and I were on, on Christmas sitting in a bus station and um, <laughs> my, my, my little kid, like my kids are like about to be in tears. They're like, where are we? Because we'd already given up our hotel. Anyway, this is this whole thing. Um, but we were able to get a kind person to, to advocate for us to get on. So we, we got on a, a very long bus to get to the other city. And it was quite an adventure that we all, we all, we all made it. And, uh, but it was, it was, that was challenging, but fun in many ways. Uh, and I guess the worst part also is just, I was really so looking forward to working in the Philippines um, and, just having that postponed for now. So that was disappointing. 
Thank you. Dr. Bradell, want to share any highlights or lowlights or both? Oh, wow, there were so many highlights. Um, it's really hard to pick, you know, one thing because, I mean, there were some activities that I did that were connected with Fulbright that had nothing to do with LGBTQ stuff um, that were just amazing that I, I was able to, to kind of tap into. Um, uh, for example, I, I was able to, uh, I applied for a, a program where I was one of the UK people that uh, we, we went to uh, Brussels and it was a, it was kind of the um, Brussels uh, Fulbright uh, organization to help us understand the EU. And so we, we learned about the EU, we learned about the, the European court, uh, we went to Luxembourg and it was just so fascinating. It was so interesting. Um, I kept kind of like pinching myself, like, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm learning this. Um, and there were several uh, sort of events like that. But I think uh, one thing that really stands out is collecting data in Birmingham uh, in the UK. It's this gritty, it's sort of like Detroit. It's sort of the analogy for the US. And it wasn't, you know, I had given talks and had done different things that, you know, felt um, uh, that really pushed me out of my comfort zone. And, you know, were you know, some of the, uh, yeah, just difficult kind of things for me to think about to prepare for professionally. But, you know, I was just sort of down in the the muck, collecting data at the hospital and um, with students. And it just, uh, I just really, really enjoyed it. I made some really great connections there. People that I still am in contact with. I, I made some friends there that um, they've come over several times to stay with us in New York and we've gone over to stay with them. Um, yeah, and I think difficult, uh, hands down, similar to Sharon was, uh, my husband didn't come. He, he had to hold the fort down in New York and I uh, experienced homesickness, you know, in my, in my late fifties, I, I had a good case of homesickness where I would just miss um, everybody so much. Um, luckily we have all this incredible technology and I could, you know, uh, FaceTime and Skype and do different things. But um, that was by far the hardest um, was just being separated from loved ones. I think we can all relate to that at some level for sure. Thank you both for sharing. I wanna wrap it up with um, hopefully a, a last question that makes sense. Um, what is something in your career that you are proudest of? And then if there's anything that you wanna plug before we go, feel free to uh, plug it now. I know you're both very accomplished, so it's going to be difficult to choose one thing. <laughs> wow. I mean that sincerely. <laughs> Most proud of, wow, what a difficult question. I feel like, um, like I'm on an interview, right? <laughs> These are like really complicated interview questions. Um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. I just, uh, I, I'm so impressed by your work, you know? Well, thanks. <laughs> I think for me, it would be the LGBT um, docs, the, the new scale that I developed. I, you know, I worked so hard on it. Um, and I, I try to um, dress, of course, now that I have this scale, I'm seeing all the holes in this scale and things that I, I wish I had done differently. Um, but I, I think sort of a lot of people are using it and the feedback that I get is so um, overwhelmingly positive. And, um, you know, because it's an international scale, it, there's just been tons of people that have translated it. I, I think it's been translated into 10 different languages. Um, and I love it. Like nurses are using it. Physicians are using it. Psychologists are using it. Social workers are using it. So I feel like it, you know, it's really meeting a need. Um, and I guess the plug that I would put in that I'm telling students that we need to start developing scales and understanding patient perceptions of LGBT care. Um, and I know Sharon's done a bit of this work, but I really, um, I'm doing some work with Dr. Mandy Chapman 
um, on a scale that I think is really important. And that's how are patients perceiving kind of competent, good care from providers. Um, so sort of self-report scales, I think have, have helped us and we've gained, you know, um, some good knowledge from it, but I think we really need to be tapping into um, LGBTQI plus individuals and find out what their experiences are and, um, and, and really working on that, that end a lot more. That's, that's, I think, really the cutting edge right now. Uh, so I totally agree. And I think, I think we should talk again, Marcus, about potential because we have some similar projects going on. And so it'd be fun to collaborate. But um, I, you know, the ice and that statement certainly is something I'm very proud of. Uh, I think, you know, having a, a program of research that says uh, that, you know, that, that basically is centering that policies, laws, um, systems play a role in mental health impact um, on LGBTQI people. And that the more that we can sh demonstrate that link, um, you know, the better we can understand what what it means to be, you know, sexual gender minority or, or minoritized people um, living it within these systems. And so, I, you know, I think that kind of program of centering that, and and I'm most proud of, my, you know, I I, I uh, um, work I teach in a doctoral program, so so I'm just really proud of all the work that. The students are doing to continue on new programs of research that are focusing on these very things um, with slightly different lenses, but very, very much carrying on this focus on on justice and liberation and how do we um, create a um, you know, safe and caring and inclusive world for LGBTQ people. What a perfect note to end it on. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Horn and Dr. Bedell for joining us. It was really such a pleasure to talk with both of you. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I'm going to post in the chat one more time, links to some other things as part of the conference. We have a couple of storytelling sessions after this, but then we're wrapping it up. So thank you both for being here and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much. Such yeah, thanks pleasure. so much. Absolutely. Take it's care. Really good everyone. seeing you again, Sharon. And really nice meeting you. you finally, Michaela. Yeah. Likewise, likewise. Likewise. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Michaela. And we I look forward to to being, you know, following all what's going on with Fulbright Prism and being involved in any way that would be helpful. Yes, stay in touch, both of you. Seriously, please yeah. do. <laughs> just just a one, I mean, I know we're